morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very significant evening event for Ag Research's future in the Beacon Farm project. Now we have 65 people at least registered tonight. So first of all, I want to say thank you very much for your participation and your interest. And here's hoping that, that uh, technology doesn't let us down as it tends to in, in these uh, Zoomy days. Now, I am Peter Morrow, and I'm Vice Chair of Ag Research. And to set the scene, perhaps you could let me uh, make some further introductions. Our Chairman, Seamus McCaffrey, is unable to join us tonight, and uh, he sends his apologies. I'm sure you'll all know John Henning, who is our Senior Vice Chair, and Jason Rankin, our General Manager, he'll be well known to you, and Gillian Hoy, our Research Manager. Now, Gillian had the joy of joining the organization back in March at the very beginning of lockdown. So she hasn't been out and about quite as much as she would have liked to have been. But between us, we'll be taking you through a presentation on the Beacon Farm Project, which is the principal outcome of a major strategic review of Ag Research's role and activity, which we conducted throughout 2020. And we announced the outcomes, the outflows of that, uh, through the media and social media just a few weeks ago, and I'm sure you're, you're well aware of that because your, your response in being here tonight is evidence. So after that presentation uh, by us, Denise Lowe from AFBE will give a short talk on hubs, that's the Hills and Uplands for Beef and Sheep project, and how hubs can tie in with the Beacon Farm project itself. And Denise, you're very welcome to uh, here tonight with us. Uh, finally, we will, uh, after the presentation, open the floor to Q&As, and if you click on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box, which will allow you to enter questions. So, I think that's really enough for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. So, just to kind of give you uh, an introduction to what we're all about, hopefully most of you are well aware of what Ag Research is. We were established in 1997. We are an independent charity. Our objective, we have created as an, uh, to find a mechanism through which beef, sheep and dairy farmers could have a direct involvement in production oriented research and our guiding principles provide practical benefit for primary producers to reduce costs, improve performance, drive innovation and welfare. We're very much a by farmers, for farmers organisation, all the staff are farmers and indeed most of the trustees and advisory committee members who oversee our operation are also from the farming sector as well. We are funded by a non-statutory voluntary levy uh, collected by the dairy and meat processors, and we've used that money then to leverage additional funding with always trying to get maximum value for the farmer levy. So, Ag Research has used that to, to support, facilitate, and share a vast range of research, and you'll see some of the kind of things we've done here. We've had over 100 projects in the uh, 23 years odd that we have been in existence. Hopefully you're all very familiar with, with GrassCheck and what it is, it's our main flagship project. And we do a lot of range of other studies in dairy. For example, one recently we covered was the protein, the homegrown proteins, uh, done various work in beef and sheep as well here. So you can see here a leaflet we published not so long ago on housing and flooring options for cattle. And obviously in our history, we have done an awful lot of on-farm research and farm demonstration. And we do like to put a lot of emphasis into knowledge exchange because we're well aware that a report on a shelf isn't a whole lot of use to you. You want to see that on the ground. You want to see those practical inputs out there. So uh, our view of the agri-research strategy commenced in early 2020, spurred on by several things. Firstly, there was changing in research funding availability. A lot of the, the research that we had, funding sources that we had availed of in the past were coming to an end or no longer as available. But also we recognize that, you know, food and farming is changing quite beyond all recognition. And that's obviously been even more accelerated by the, the events of the last number of months. And I think, as we said here in a recent press release we issued, the key challenge in facing farmers is the ability to produce that, continue to produce high quality, affordable food for a growing population, but also addressing the societal concerns of animal welfare and environmental gains. And of course, one of the primary challenges we face is, is this target of trying to be carbon neutral by, by 2045 and that's a huge challenge for us and a huge challenge for society as a whole. So we engaged in a comprehensive strategy review exercise earlier in the year and we engaged broadly with industry at a farmer survey, thanks to everyone who pulled that in. 
We engage in our advisory committees, we engage with our stakeholders as well. Um, Nigel Scollin, who I hope is on, he is registered, I'm not sure if he's on tonight or not, also very kindly put on together an expert script for us. And you can hear, see here some of the, the excellent people we had on that. Jerry Boyle from Chagres, Lynn Frewer, Professor in Food and Society from Newcastle, Simon Pearson from Lincoln, Liam Sinclair, well known to many of you for the BGS and a leading dairy lecturer and scientist at Harper Adams. Heather Jenkins, formerly uh, Director of Agriculture and Buying at, uh, at Waitrose and also involved in Innovate, so very aware of where research is going. And Mike McGann, again, a leading dairy farmer from Longford, uh, the driving force and the founding chairman behind Animal Health Ireland, and also chair of the Agricultural Trust, which owns the Irish Farmers Journal. And they were, they gave some very, very good input. So basically, they did see, you know, we did see a need to change. We need to pay to our core strengths, facilitating and disseminating that on-farm research. A need for long-term thinking, and because we've always been chasing funds, it led us kind of to a portfolio of roughly 30 ongoing projects. So again, a bit of a danger of being busy fools in this whole thing. A more strategic focus is much more important, more targeted program approach. I need to be more holistic. Quite often our research projects look at one element in isolation. And we're all aware, for example, if you breed, if you select for one index on one attribute only, you can often have perverse outcomes. So you have to look at all things and be more holistic. And that's why we thought really we need to look at a more farm level, a more system approach, which addresses the full thing. And also to be a lot bit more longer term, because unfortunately, because of the nature of research funding, a lot of projects tend to be two, three years but some of the big challenges we're facing, you know, we're talking about carbon neutral by 2045 and it will take us that long to get there. So I need to be a lot more longer term and horizon focused in our thinking. And I need for science increasing, this was coming back to us even before we started the strategy review process, farmers saying, you know, we need to get off the back foot here. We need evidence to be provided to show the value, the ecosystem services that we know that farmers are delivering, the carbon sequestration and so on. So we formulated a strategy and the main plank of our strategy is the creation of a beacon farm network, which is obviously what you're all here to hear about today. So, so what is the beacon farm network? A structured, intentional and semi-permanent farm network, which can be used for research. As I said, we've tended to chase funding and we've gone for projects and projects by the nature tend to be, generally speaking, no longer than three years. And that maybe gives you two years for really some decent on-farm work and then a year right up. That's kind of usually the way these things work. And it's actually not long enough to look at a lot of these traits. You tend to look at one item in isolation, but things like carbon sequestration, it's going to take at least five years to monitor that. And we need to have a more longer term strategic look at this thing. So looking at a targeted program approach, looking at a more systems approach and realizing that, you know, people talk about sustainability and they often associate with that the environment, but there are three pillars. But sustainability is a three-legged stool. And those three stools are people, planets, and profits. We're probably used to hearing an awful lot about the environment, and certainly it's not going away. We all know about the importance of making profit. As they say, uh, it's hard to be green if you're not in the red. But often people is the most underlooked one, and it's one I think that deserves more attention. We have to remember that at the heart of our agriculture industry in Northern Ireland are thousands of family farms. You know, Farming is, a, is very much a family business, and we all know the pressures and that can come with that. And farming can be a wonderful place for you and your family, or it can be a hellish place for you and your family. So that people, but is very important as well. To drive the cultural change, and we are well aware, having our exper previous experience with on-farm research and the, the extension that that brings, is that farmers learn best from other farmers. And we really want to try and make champions of innovative farmers, because that's really how you will get that cultural change and that adoption. So we want to make champions of innovative farmers. To allow for consistency and longevity in on-farm research, because too often things just start and just start going, and then the project comes to an end. Uh, really, we want a much longer-term view on this, but also to enable farmers to influence agenda and research to kind of commit to that longer-term vision and so on. So we're hoping that the you know, the evidence coming out of this will help inform policy. Um, we're obviously very aware that there's a whole new agriculture support mechanism being considered in the future. Uh, we're talking about more output-based payments, possibly, for environment. That brings its own challenges. So how are we going to metrify that? If we're going to pay people to sequester, how do we measure that? How do we know what they're doing? How do we know farmers can maximise their sequestration or other ecosystem services they're delivering? And how do we do this while still maintaining output? You know, like Peter McCann's on it, and he wrote, you know, it's very easy just to go nature farming and go bust in short order. So we have to do things that deliver for the environment, deliver for production, and deliver for profit as well. So... 
what will it do? We're looking to comprise a representative selection of farms across Northern Ireland. We're thinking around 50 farms. And we want that right across the whole game. So dairy, beef, sheep, mixed, and the full range of systems on that. We're quite aware, you know, part-time farming is a hugely important part, especially in the beef and sheep sector. We want to include those guys because you're responsible for balancing an awful lot of Northern Ireland and you know, we can't ignore those, that sector. Lowland, upland, all the live types, intensive and extensive. So this is, we're looking for the full range uh, and, and geograph- geography too. So really what we would like, our ambition would be that every dairy, beef and sheep farmer in Northern Ireland can at least relate to one or two other of the beacon farms and say, they're like me and what they do, what they learn, what they adopt and what they demonstrate, I can relate to on my farm. That's just not all the, you know, the top 5% or all you know, in the most productive ground or whatever. We want everyone to be able to relate to at least one or two of those beacon farms. So what are we looking for? We're looking for people who will aspire to improve on farm operations, both their own and help everyone else in the industry with that. There will be a lot of data to collect, uh, but we'll try and make that as easy and as simple as possible. And we'll talk a little bit more of that in a moment. Uh, but we'll be obviously trying to look at a set of series of benchmarks over people, plant and profit over the next five years. And that's kind of what we think is a minimum term. For the initial term, we may wish to push it out longer, depending. Obviously, we want farmers who are willing to share and communicate those project outcomes. So, you know, if you can engage, willing to host farm walks. But obviously, co- coronavirus has actually forced us to embrace a whole new digital medium. And like we've got 54 on at the moment when we had a webinar last night with almost 300 on it. And I can't imagine that we'd ever, we'd never had that at a, any conference or, or farm walk we ever had. So digital offers us many new opportunities and it's the technologies we wish to, to use. So helping us to communicate with those. And Cable working in partnership with others, because as I'll just say in a moment, this will be very much a partnership approach with AgriSearch and a number of our partners in, in, in other industry organizations and so on. I suppose the thing to note here, first of all, and maybe a word of caution, AgriSearch is a small organization with a small staff and a limited budget. So there's limits to what we can do. We can establish the network, we can have those relationships with the farmers, and we hope to aim to collect a kind of fairly low common denominator source of metrics. But there will be lots of opportunities for other projects to piggyback on that. And there's already some projects underway which can do that and others in the pipeline. So next, so we've got Grass Check obviously going on at the moment. We'll use it. We have another Euro- European project called Super G, which we're halfway through in our two and a half years to run. And that's looking at the synergies and trade-offs between production and ecosystem services. And that's already using some of the farms we've got in the Grass Check network. In a moment, Denise, and I'll not say too much about this, but we are, we've got a project in the pipeline for Hills and Uplands for Beef and Sheep. And Denise uh, from AFI will be speaking a little bit about that in a moment. We, we have been working with our sister work at Levy Bodies and GB on a project called Ram Compare. It's been based at Hillsborough for the, the regional, but they we're talking about a new phase and there could be opportunities to bring on some sheep farmers here. And finally, uh, we have a new project called Resilience for Dairy. Uh, it's Horizon 20 thematic network. Um, it will involve 17 partners from 15 countries across Europe, and we'll be looking for six dairy farmers to get involved in that, and there'll be opportunities for exchange and so on. So there'll be more opportunities, and we're already talking to, to research organisations about more opportunities. We've got huge enthusiasm for Appy Queens and others, and what we're doing here, we're, we're currently engaged with Appy in a, in a bid for Horizon 2020 funding, which would put a major project maybe involving 20 of the farms on strategies to improve fertilizer usage and and reduce nutrient runoff we're discussing with colleagues in queens opportunities for phd students to work in the whole theme of um, anthelmintic resistance and parasite control so there's there's you know and there's 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 more who are very interested after you'd like to do some more work on on carbon sequestration so we think that this if we provide put our resources into the platform others can come i can add a lot more to it and be more options to add and and add to that so that's that's way the way we see it going Okay, I'm going to hand over to Gillian now, who's been doing some of the, the work behind the metrics and so on to explain around the data collection and then the recruitment methods we'll be going through. So we talked a wee bit there about some of the metrics that we might be uh, looking from the Bacon Farms and how we'll actually go about uh, collecting that information from you. So data is going to be central to this project, but we want to make sure that it's as simple as possible for those taking part um, to both gather that data and share it with ourselves, because we know your time is precious and we want this to be uh, as as easy a project for you to take part in uh, as possible. So 
for the first year, we'll really be focusing on gathering a range of sort of baseline data to see where we are at the minute. And then as we go through the project, we will then be comparing maybe if there's been changes on farm or if we've been working on projects, we'll be able to compare that to the baseline. So we'll be gathering data in a few different ways. And um, we'll be trying to make as much use as possible of central sources of data. And that could be uh, data held on AFIS at present, perhaps in Vet and Press, using uh, resources that are available to the public, such as uh, GIS maps and things like that to um, assess habitat areas within your farm, maybe uh, land types, et cetera. We'll be adding to that by doing some site visits as well. And that's where we'll either be sending uh, some of our own staff out on site or perhaps contracting others to, to do some work for us. And that could be in the areas of, for example, soil sampling across your farm, perhaps both standard soil sampling and um, the likes of taking some soil carbon cores, which are a bit more complex. There's also routes perhaps in the future to go down the likes of biodiversity sampling and things like that. And that's where we would pull in that expertise where required. But at the heart of it really will be data that will be recorded by the farmers in the project itself. And that could be the likes of inputs and outputs, which would perhaps go into our, our uh, efforts to, to look at greenhouse gas net balance calculations, perhaps looking at animal performance records, labour records to, to look at that social aspect, grass utilisation, and the list could go on and on and on there. But what we want to do is, and we have been exploring some options to use these new digital solutions that are becoming more and more available to us, make that data recording and data sharing um, a bit easier as well. So we've been having a few conversations with some software providers, uh, such as AgriWeb, which is where these images on the right hand side are from. And they are sort of more app based solutions where you would be able to input information as and when you're doing it out and about on the farm. And we would be able to, to sort of remote into that and gather that data without having to, to chase you up every so often as well. So, so that's one of the solutions. And but what we're doing at the minute is we're, we're exploring those options. And actually, as part of our application form, we're, we're, we've asked a few questions in there to see what solution or software solutions people are actually already using, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel in this area, but we're very much open to this uh, and want to make that data collection aspect as easy as possible. And that really brings us more on to the, the participant benefits of taking part as well. So the benefits are across a, a few different areas in the way that we see it. There's the upfront monetary benefit, which I'll run through, which was in some of our information booklets that we've sent out if you've already seen them. So for taking part, there is a thousand pounds per year payment for participants, and that really is to to recognise the the time and effort that uh, the beacon farmers will be putting into this project, both collecting that data and and taking part in the network in any discussion groups, etc. As part of that, if we ever get back to where we're we're working with physical meetings, there's mileage opportunities there as well to to make sure that. Um, if you're having to travel from different area of the country that we can compensate you from that. Um, and as Jason said, we're, we're very much committed to uh, dissemination events, knowledge exchange events out on farm. Um, and so we may ask some of the participants to host farm walks from time to time and there would be additional payment for that as well. And then the other monetary benefits would be maybe in the likes of if we were to go down the lines of using some of these data collection software tools, uh, we would be able to, to make those available to you um, for free to be able to use them in the project. So there'd be the opportunity to get involved with that as well. But we're hoping that the benefits for, for the participants won't just be monetary. There will be the benefit of actually having those research outcomes from your own farm. So knowing your own greenhouse gas farm balance, knowing your soil analysis results, and that will be a constant dialogue between ourselves and yourselves. Uh, the data we collect will be constantly fed back to you for you to use um, in your own decision making as well. And we hope that it'll be a learning opportunity for you, both sharing within the network with the others there and actually working with the research partners that, that we'll be bringing in for these projects. And finally, there's also then Jason touched on it a wee bit, but the opportunity to actually influence research agendas. If there's anything that you've been thinking about maybe undertaking on your own farm, perhaps something new, innovative, novel, and, and maybe there hasn't been much research on it to date, that's something that will be, you know, seeking that feedback and, and, and commentary and maybe be able to, to influence uh, where we take the research in the future as well. So just touching then on the selection process, hopefully you have all seen our sort of information booklet online. You've maybe had a wee look to see where the, the application form is held. And actually, I know that some of the, the participants that registered tonight have actually already submitted their applications. So thank you for doing that. That's great. Um, we've gone down the route of an online application form this time. It's just using the, the SurveyMonkey process. And we've tried 
to make it as easy as possible. So hopefully you find it that way. Recruitment is now open, as I've said, and applications will remain open until 12 noon on Monday, the 4th of January. So still plenty of time to put an application form in there. Uh, the form itself is just really to uh, it'll collect a lot of information about yourself and your farm, and that will help us ensure that we can tick off some of our representation uh, requirements. And then it also goes through a few other bits and pieces about uh, how you currently collect data, your experience to date, a few other bits and pieces like that as well. Uh, it shouldn't take you too long to fill in, but uh, if you do have any questions on that form, feel free to get in touch with us at any time. There's a, an email address there at the bottom of the screen. It's just beacon at agresearch.org and we'll be able to get back to you as quickly as possible on that. Applications will, will close on the 4th of January. We hope to have a selection panel, an independent selection panel will be reviewing those and making their decisions in January, hopefully towards the start of January. And as Jason said previously, we're seeking approximately 50 farms at this stage. But uh, depending on, on the numbers of applications that we receive, we may be able to, to phase that participation to make sure we, we are being uh, representative as we, we bring farms into the network. So hopefully by the end of January, we will have been in touch. Either we'll see how we get on with the selection process. We might have to, you never know in these times with COVID, but uh, we hope to be able to be in touch by the end of January um, with the outcomes from that. Um, and for those of you that haven't filled in the application form, all the links are available on our website. So I'd encourage you to, to definitely go there. Thank you very much, no Gillian problem. and Jason, on that overview. And now if I could ask Denise Lowe from AFPE to uh, talk about hubs and how it might interweave in the future with, with Beacon Farms. Thank you, Peter. And thanks for the opportunity to spend a few minutes just giving you an outline of the project where we would also like to recruit farmers using the Beacon Farm application process. So as Peter has said, the project that I want to talk about is known as HUBS, which stands for Hills and Uplands for Beef and Sheep. So um, this project is all about looking at the synergies and the trade-offs that exist between production and the many other ecosystem services that beef and sheep farming in the hills and uplands of Northern Ireland can provide. So at the minute, we are currently in the first phase of this project, and this is really a scoping exercise to review the literature and see where the gaps in the knowledge are. So I mentioned the ecosystem services that Hills and Uplands can provide, and we're interested in food production, in carbon sequestration and storage, improving water quality, entering the water courses, mitigating risk of flooding and wildfires, and managing habitats to improve biodiversity. And we also want to highlight and improve the cultural role that beef and sheep farming in the hills and uplands provides. In fact, I was in a meeting this morning and I was asked to define culture as um, it's one of those things that can mean a whole lot of different things in a political context in Northern Ireland. So just to be very clear, what I mean by cultural ecosystem services are things like recreation, so hill walking, and the impact of green space on both physical and mental well-being. And I think that's something that has really come to the fore during this pandemic for the, for the general public. And then there's a very important piece in there also on the mental well-being of the farmer themselves and the factors in play there. There are other ecosystem, uh, cultural ecosystem services found in the hills and uplands, such as heritage sites and tourism. But what I wanted to visualise in, in the next slide is that one of the really basic principles of this project is that we don't look at the ecosystem services in isolation from each other, but rather um, it's how important it is that we look at them holistically. So phase one of this project will go on until May 2021. And we, so we currently now are at the stage where we want to recruit farmers throughout Northern Ireland who would be interested in being co-researchers with us in phase two. So phase two will be the experimental stage of the project. So in order to do this, we want to work closely with our colleagues at CAFRI um, using the Glenwary Hill Farm, but we also would like to recruit five farms based throughout Northern Ireland, as we're very conscious there'll be a range of farm types and systems. So these farms could be sheep only, cattle only, or, or cattle and sheep. And it is likely that we may do things slightly differently on different farms, but there certainly will be a focus on net carbon emissions, 
biodiversity and water quality. So the questions in the Beacon Farm application are very relevant to the recruitment of these co-researchers too. So it seemed to make sense that we would piggyback into that system. So I'm going to hand you back to Peter. Um, but if anybody wants any, I mean, I, obviously I'm happy to answer questions tonight, but if you go away and you have other points of clarification, um, you have my details, my email address and my phone number there. So I'm very happy um, if anybody wants any points of clarification on down the line. Well, thank you very much, Denise. Uh, it's pretty clear from the presentation that there is indeed a big deal of overlap between what you're setting out to do and what, what we're setting out to do, basically. And let's look for the synergies because partnership has been a big part of our thought process throughout the, uh, the whole strategy re review. Partnership and, and looking for synergies and not reinventing wheels and doing silly things like that. It's about, about trying to, to think clever and box clever. And it's all about responding to a change. I mean, I saw that Bob Dylan sold his uh, back network of songs a couple of weeks ago for a reported $300 million, I think it was. And one of his most famous songs, of course, the times they are changing. It's certainly that way for the farming industry worldwide. And um, there's a big challenge coming down the, the road at us in a, in, a, in a large cart, and it's called the environment and sustainability. And one of the problems, the big problems in carbon, the whole carbon issue is and emissions, is that people see farming as part, as the problem, or indeed, if not so bad, as part of the problem. And what we're trying to do is put in systems which can prove that farming, far from being the problem, is a big part of delivering the solutions. And that is the big challenge facing us. So look, um, thank you all speakers. And I think we have a few questions coming in. So, and then we'll just... I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to put this to, to the speakers, and um, John Henning is joining us uh, at this part too. So Malachi Dolan asked the question, will you be providing an input-output form? At this stage, um, we're still working out exactly how we'll be accessing all the information from each of the participants. Um, Inputs-outputs will be one of the aspects that we will likely be looking at in phase one. And what we'll probably do is, is learn from some of the previous research projects that we've worked on as to how we go about doing that. Uh, we could be doing that manually through the likes of forms, but we may also be able to look at some aspects of those inputs and outputs through some of the software solutions that I perhaps mentioned slightly earlier in the presentation. It's a, I think, Malachi, it's, it's a very good question. And having been involved, I know Denise being involved in uh, many on-farm research projects for the weakness, and the, the biggest challenge is always data collection on farm. Uh, we want to make that as easy as possible to collect that data automatically. If you're already using software, can we get it straight off there? Because we don't want to put any more burden on the farms. On, and ideally, if we can make it easy so that when you're uh, maybe going out to spread a load of fertilizer or whatever, you, you can put it on your phone then and there, and that's a done job. We can harvest it off that. So we want to make that as easy as possible. Okay, we've got an anonymous question here. At a high level, what are the top three outcomes that I research hopes to achieve from the Beacon Farm now? Um, I mean, I think that there obviously, as you have said in your, your remarks just now, there is this big issue facing agriculture where agriculture is seen as the problem. Uh, and we're very much uh, of the view that farming and agriculture and, and indeed the whole agri-food sector is, 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 a, is a big part of the solution. And it's certainly at a, at a very high level, this would be a way in which we can actually go about uh, providing the science and the data to prove that that is the case. And so uh, that would be certainly would, it would be one uh, aspect we would want to come out of this. Yeah. You know, I, I think... We have the phrase in there, people, planet and profit, and you know, it, it can look a bit gimmicky at times to have catchy phrases, but it, it, for me it really does say a, a lot about what, what we do hope to achieve from the, the net network. If I could start with people, the people are farming, farmers, the people are society, they're consumers, they are looking at different issues nowadays, the environment and sustainability is a very big issue, uh, it brings in the planet, and and we are going to have to, to address it. It's not something which from a production point of view, uh, we're, we're widely used to thinking. Certainly I was I doing agriculture at Newcastle University in the mid seventies and the word sustainability just didn't come into the lexicon. 
the environment meant a whole different thing, and depending on where, which party you're going to that night. And profit, <laughs> profit, the third point, is fundamental to us here. You know, whatever, whatever we do to address these issues, farming must remain profitable or must become profitable or more profitable in order to deliver what society demands. And part of the thrust and the, and, and the drive and what we're trying to do is not just at farm level, but it's very much at persuasion level, showing people out there what farming really is about, how seriously it takes this issue and what it's doing to ensure that it delivers sustainable, profitable farming in the future. And for me, that's really it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, in terms of kind of, I was jotting down there when I saw that question come up, well, what are the three high level outputs? So I mean, I think, you know, maybe in more practical terms, I think, you know, carbon, uh, when we did our survey of all the stakeholders, carbon was issue number one. 2045 or 2050 might sound an awful long way away, but we, as we saw in the, the DERA consultation that came out last week, you know, they're looking at five-year targets on the way, and it will take time to do that, so we really need to get our head around that one. Profitability, absolutely. Systems and succession, making farming a pleasant and profitable place to work. And public, which, as Peter has just said then, and actually a phrase that came out recently was, you know, farming social license or license to operate. And I think it's something farmers are quite keen on, because, okay, it's improved slightly during coronavirus, because I think people have been more realised how important food is in the system but we all know that farming has been on the back foot and that we want to kind of create a much better image of farming and and really relay the good work that farmers do do and that that's a big part of that too sam chesney has asked a question and this is one for you denise with reference to hub ufu hill farming committee seen the the details uh, yes, Sam. Uh, we have a we have a very broad ranging stakeholder group in hubs of which the Hill Farming Committee is part of, and we had a meeting end of November on that, and we'll we will wind that up into some groups go forward because we have massive interest from industry. But further to that, actually, we we had actually a um, very timely question, actually, Sam, because yes. we had a meeting with the UFU Hill Farming Committee this morning, so they're very up to speed with it. Yep. There you go. Thank you, Denise. We've got oh, several anonymous attendees. This one says, I, I, I'm currently not farm quality assured, as I said all through the March. Will that rule me out of taking part in the Beacon project? Interesting question. I mean, we have put in a question that you may have seen in the application form. Are you quality assured? We, it's not a, it's not a pass-fail question. It'll be marked, but it doesn't rule you out. But I think, to be honest with you, I, I, I think increasingly that quality assurance will be necessary whether you sell direct or not because probably you know lifetime assurance will eventually come and so on it's also indication of standards so i think the short answer to that question is no it will not rule you out but we probably prefer people on the whole who are quality assured if you're six if we get receive 60 or 70 good applications will you take them all on well i think i can start that by saying I think get, we, we, we thought when we set out even to get to 50 would be a, a very good achievement because it's not just selecting, there are great farmers out there, it's not just about selecting 40, 50, 60, 70 of them. It's about actually implementing it at farm level and phasing ourselves into it in a more in a properly organized way in order that we kind of maximize the return. Uh, Jason, you better time yeah no you. i think i mean I, I think that's right i mean part of the reason around 50 is it's what we can resource and what we can afford as an organization we wouldn't say you know if, if we had 60 or 70 really good applications we might have to take them all on we might kind of say well we can't take you all on but put you on a reserve list and if other funding opportunities or whatever came up we could look at it so never say never but it would beyond it'd be it would it would give us a digestion put it that way at the moment and be beyond our resources to go that that kind of number but it would be brilliant to have that interest. And if it did, it would be an opportunity for us to go back and look for other opportunities to involve more farmers in the future. It'd be a nice problem to have. Uh, John Egerton asks, is there a separate application for the hubs? And Yeah, hi, John. Uh, no, the application for the hubs will just come through the main bacon process. And of course, we'll be able to home down in that into beef and sheep from, from the hills and uplands. We're interested in a lot of the same parameters. So anybody who, who doesn't, for example, fill those criteria but doesn't want to be part of hubs, you know, you can add that to your form, certainly. So you don't you don't have to be considered for hubs if you don't want to be, but it's the same application process. 
Yeah, I think just to add to that, you know, as I said earlier, there will be another of our projects that we hope will piggyback on this. So Hubs is kind of one that's probably maybe closest or you know, and also we kind of had an obligation with year that we would help identify farms for it. But there will be other opportunities for other, it'll be up to farmers to decide if they want to get involved or whatever. But as I said, we're going to have a, a European project which will be looking for really six of the dairy farmers to get involved. So there will be further opportunities down the line, but that will be at the discretion of the vegan farmers as to which ones they would like to get involved with. Is there a minimum land area for part-time farmers? We haven't actually set a minimum land area. We've kind of got a, a, a kind of vague thing about, you know, we should have roughly around 20 livestock units or something in that area, but we haven't, we haven't actually set a minimum land area. Another anonymous one, uh, what criteria should applications be assessed against? Ah, well, yeah, we have a whole range of, of, um, of scoring matrix, and I suppose most of the questions you'll see in the application form are, are, are weighted in various ways on that. So our, our scoring matrix is about three or four pages long, so I'm not going to, I can't remember off the top of my head, but obviously if you look at the application form, you'll kind of see some of the um, the criteria we're scoring on, not all necessarily equal, but those are, those are what, what we're scoring roughly against. So it, it's a whole range of things. Will you come in there, Peter, and just say that the other aspect um, that we have to bear in mind in terms of the uh, selection criteria as well is we need to have a representative yes. sample or representation of um, the three farm sectors, full part, um, many parts of the country as we possibly can can get, range of systems and so on as well. So it's yeah. not just a uh, first pass the post, That's right. post process, uh, there's, there's sort of subsets within that as well. Thank you. Um, William Chestnut asks, in terms of the carbon sequestration we see in countries like Australia, where they are beginning to monetize this in the form of carbon credits and in doing so incentivize carbon sequestration to farmers, Will this be looked at? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, that's a very interesting question, yeah. William, and you wouldn't be the only farmer looking at that. I mean, in terms of monetizing it, that's probably a slightly more government matter because that's a, that's a policy. But I think if we can even get to the stage where we have ways of... So even, even if they decided, listen, or, I mean, you can actually do a certain amount of trading. There is carbon trading going on out there at the moment. It's not particularly lucrative. The value will likely increase as... As, as, as the climate in Paris Accord hits in. But the issue, I think, William, at the moment is we can't even metrify it. So how do, how do you prove that you are sequestering half a tonne of carbon a year per hectare or whatever it is that you are doing? You, you could be doing 300, you could be doing 700 kilos, you know, there's various figures, but, you know, so before you can actually sell it, you have to metrify it and you have to authenticate it. So I think one of the first things we'll be looking at in this project is trying to get ways of authenticating that. In terms of where the market is, I mean, there already are carbon markets out there, but it's actually how we do that. Although I think a word of caution is, and depending on your farming system, now you could just go, let's go, you know, carbon farming in that, those terms. But, you know, obviously when you've got livestock or whatever, you will probably, as a word of caution, probably need a, a certain amount of that, whatever sequestration you've got on the farm to offset that. But, I mean, it is certainly a potential. I can come in at a wee bit. I've uh, some past experience of working in sort of voluntary carbon markets in the UK, primarily through the forestry sector and, and peatland restoration aspects. But as Jason says, really, the trick with uh, the farming sector in a whole is getting those metrics and that information because you can't hang a, a trading scheme or a certification scheme without the, the necessary information. There has been work going on in Europe uh, and abroad in Australia and, and New Zealand looking at aspects of that, perhaps focusing on, on certain areas. And it's something that is, is moving probably with pace, but for ourselves, it's really working and, and helping to, to provide that information as a baseline so that we can maybe add to those conversations in the future, probably. If then, um, just looking at the question, it, it, would that imply that Australia is somewhat ahead of, of us, Gillian? It depends how they set up their, their carbon markets is quite significant. Really in the UK, it, it's only based on voluntary carbon markets. And one of the main aspects that's holding it back as well is that from that side of things, you need um, companies willing to voluntarily invest in those carbon markets as well. So it's, it's that uh, supply and demand side of things as well. What's happened in the forestry and sort of peatland sectors is there is demand there, but it is not massive at that stage. And there will probably have to be more indications from, from government in the UK to maybe match those elsewhere to sort of drive that investment in, in those areas and, and drive that research that sits behind it as well. 
so what you're saying, Gillian, maybe and actually that's a good point you're making, is that at the moment people aren't offsetting on a Saturday basis. They're doing it maybe as an option when they book their EasyJet flight. There's sometimes an option for £2.50. You can offset your carbon or companies to look good will offset their carbon. So it's more a voluntary thing for us in the future, you know, especially for the aviation sector, for example, maybe forced, you just have no other way to go, will be forced to offset carbon. We'll have to buy it a bit like the renewable energy certificates that are sold and similar means to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the minute, it, it is voluntary in the UK and, and there is some aspects of double counting with that as well. So when the UK goes down the lines of, of reporting their own land use and land use change emissions uh, in in the 2020s, uh, the update keeps changing. How the, the voluntary sector and the compulsory sector interact will also be looked at as well. So there's a bit of guidance needed from the governments there on that and, and what claims can be made by companies about that, that voluntary carbon that they've made in a sector that's perhaps having some mandatory restrictions placed on it. There you go, William. Obviously, the core of the whole thing is before we can monetize it, we have to be able to measure it. So uh, a lot of work to do. Robert Martin asks, what type of research do I research wish to see farmers do on the farm research level? Yeah, so at the start, really, what we'll be focusing on is gathering sort of a baseline information on and where are you now with what you're doing now? And that will be what ourselves at iResearch will probably primarily be focusing on. The research um, aspects where we perhaps might be asking you to undertake certain actions would probably more likely be if we integrated you with a specific research program that, program that we'll, we'll build on top of the, the, the program, such as maybe hubs, or as Jason said, the, the R4D project. And so that will be mostly at the discretion of, of the participants. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, there will be a number of research questions which we'll, we'll look at. Obviously, you know, I think by definition, everyone will be involved and Beacon Farm will be involved in, in, in terms of that um, greenhouse gas benchmarking and sequestration and helping us determine how you optimize that and reducing that down. So that's kind of almost like a de facto thing everyone will be involved with. As Gillian said, year one will be very much about baselines. And then I think we'll be working with you to look at what options you would like to explore to then try and improve on that baseline to, to improve your carbon footprint or profitability or whatever else. So in terms of that, Robert, I think there'll be a whole range of options. So obviously Denise outlined hill, uh, hill, uh, Hills and Upland for Beef and Sheep. As I said, we're, we're working uh, on a, Euro a European bid for projects, looking at better fertilizer management, reducing your nutrient losses. So there'll be a, a bit of a smorgasbord, I think, of options that we can look at and that will kind of depend as we work with our research partners and other funding agencies as to what can be done so i would say the easy thing is lots of different options robert um and probably a little bit early to, to kind of be more definitive in the answer to that as will you be doing carbon survey and which greenhouse gases are we looking to reduce so we will be doing a, a greenhouse gas calculator exercise on the farms. The model that we're thinking of using at this time is actually the AgriCalc calculator, which is pulled together by SAC, Scottish Agricultural College's consulting arm, and, and they've commercialised that. It is one of the, from some of the conversations that we've had with, with others that have used and trialled a, a number of these calculators, it's the one that is able to, to split out the gases in a way in which um, we can sort of isolate methane. And so um, if GWTP star comes in, we can um, amend those results accordingly. It is something we're still looking at. We haven't committed to using that calculator, but it is. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, it gives us the flexibility to ensure that the results coming from it we can use should the, the values change in the future. We have another anonymous question. Will all data collected on farm be made available in the public domain or will it stay closed within the network? Uh, yeah, uh, a, good, a good question there and uh, very valid. So um, we will treat, you know, uh, it will be treated, so it will, it'll be used for research and we'll be going to research partners, but it will be anonymized before going to research and we would consult with any farmer uh, before we made any kind of individual farm level information more publicly available. So uh, well, and we'll be very careful and discreet. And one of the reasons for kind of us coordinating this network is that we have control over that data and where it goes to make sure it's not used. You know, the last thing we want is that any of this is used to beat anyone up with. So definitely we, you know, that's something we're very cognizant of. 
So basically, in terms of, you know, we would make data available to researchers because at the end of the day, we're not scientists. If we want scientists to look at this, we have to give it to them, but, but it will be anonymized data or it'll be subject to non-disclosure agreements. Uh, and in the public domain, it will be only by agreement with the farmers what we decide to put out in the public domain. Can I just um, add there, Peter, that one of the things that came out of the surveys and all of the work that we did with our experts groups and so on was the fact that farmers uh, and levy payers valued the independence of agri-research um, and obviously that would you know would, would continue into the beacon farm network as well well just while you're on john try this one now must all beacon farmers be agri-research levy payers that is a good question we haven't actually discussed that as yet in terms of the uh, the selection um process unless Jason and Gillian, you have actually made a decision on that, but I know certainly well, in the initial the, meeting that we have, we haven't actually. The short, that I, suppose, I suppose the short answer to that, John, is we have no, we do not have records of who pays levy and who does not. That that is not something we are. Okay, we can say if, if someone sells so much and doesn't sell anything to a dairy processor or a meat plant, then we can say he's not like a levy collector, levy pair. But we don't actually have records. We are not provided by the levy collectors with records of of levy pairs, so we have no way of checking that out. Well, that's a pretty definitive line, and I think it's fair to say that we would love all dairy and red meat uh, producers to be levy pairs because it shares the pain for everybody and shares the gain too because the budgets will be bigger for, for everybody and for the entire industry. We've seen another anonymous one. Who, who all has access to the data from the Beacon Farms? Well, I think we've kind of covered that off Yep. In, in the previous answer uh, a couple of questions ago in terms of sharing so let's move on martin mccaffrey asks will farmers be considered who farm heavy land conditions and may not be that intensive yeah you... uh, i mean uh, that's a good question and, and absolutely we're not looking for all very intensive farms in this in fact it actually be good to have a few more extensive farms for various reasons obviously you know we're looking at, at various attributes and so on so we're not we're not as i said we're looking for a representative sample across northern ireland of different systems and we absolutely recognize that there are our farms that are not suited to being intensive because of the land type because the, the farmer is part-time or whatever so no we're not looking for every farm to be intensive by any means ryan carr asks um, are there any other agricultural organizations in GB or Ireland or the rest of the world for that matter already investigating the route of farming carbon neutrality? There definitely are uh, and that is one of the the aspects that we do want to pull into this project. We do want to be aware of what is happening elsewhere and we want to be able to bring that into what we're doing. So either that through our methodologies or, or through our actions that we take on farm will definitely be we'd be drawing that in. There's absolutely no point in us reinventing the wheel when there's maybe information elsewhere. But we do also have to recognise that it has to be suitable for Northern Ireland as well uh, and take into account uh, our own conditions and whether or not it would be suitable. Right. I think another point we need to make there is there's been a lot of work on carbon intensity you know, in terms of reducing carbon intensity, well, you know, that is the carbon footprint of a liter of milk, a kilo of beef, a kilo of lamb or whatever. But the whole concept of that net zero of the offset and so on is that it's starting to be looked at, but probably, you know, in terms of that, you've got the Devonish as a state of diary, they're probably leaders in that field. And, you know, it, it, it's a fairly new one. And in terms of that kind of carbon neutral target, that's probably... For, it hasn't been as investigated a lot of work into the in, intensity and reducing emissions but in terms of that neutrality aspect and the sequestration aspect of offset more limited work david clark asks will there be any cl collaboration with industry to reduce carbon throughout the supply chain and also share the cream when it comes to marketing low carbon product at a higher value margin passing on the added value back down the chain well, I think, first of all, David, it's a very good question. It, it, it is well down the line because, as everybody keeps saying, we're still at the stage of trying to, to, to learn how to measure, never mind uh, use the information. But a big part of our thinking in, in, in this strategy is maximizing partnership and collaboration throughout the industry and, and with whoever has an interest, like a, a genuine interest in the subject. And we will certainly be looking at that. Would John, anybody else wish to add anything to that? 
The only thing I would add, and I agree totally with you, Peter, uh, it is a very good question. And I, I would have thought that as we get towards that point in the research program, uh, and it, it might not be in the, the, the very early stages, uh, but we would uh, try and avoid uh, situations that have occurred in the industry before where things were, were held up as being uh, a premium and ultimately became a baseline. There's also another aspect in, in the industry is starting to look at, and that's a, a term called natural capital. And a lot of companies in the, the food and drink sector are starting to recognize and acknowledge um, the role that natural resources actually play in their supply chains uh, and look at the ways in which they can invest in those to ensure that they have those supply chains in the future as well. And so I know the likes of some of the dairy processors are, are, are getting on board with this concept. And so uh, looking down their, their chain towards primary production on farm. Um, I think that is something that will, will be increasing in the coming years as well. Francis McDonald asked, will you be doing a carbon survey and which greenhouse gases we're looking to reduce? Well, I think we, we covered that one off earlier too. David Dawson asks, will there be one advisor with sole responsibility of overseeing the Beacon Farms? Yeah, I suppose in terms of, I mean, we're not a farm advisory service. So we'll be working with you and we'll hopefully have scientists working and so on. We'll, we'll work where you are, opening up to discussions with Caffrey as to how we work with them. But I suppose to be fair and I, you know, neither Gillian or I would, would, would qualify as, as advisors. We're, we're more in the research end of things. But yes, I think, you know, I think you will learn through this experience. I would hesitate to say we're offering a farm advice service because that's, that's not our field and that's not what we're here to do, but we will have a number of staff who will be working with the farm. Maliki Dolan asks, do you see a cap and trade system developing? Well, is, is that not getting back to the Australia question? Somewhat, yes. It would probably be more, rather than sort of voluntary carbon trading, it would be more in the sort of industry-specific compliance market, I would say, and, and whether or not the UK government uh, sets targets for each industry um, and should for example, agriculture actually be able to, to hit net zero and maybe exceed that, could we then trade those emissions with another industry which perhaps doesn't have that sequestration opportunity? First, I would say probably farming has to get to that net zero point and, and then probably look at how it can then work with, with other industries to sort of potentially do a, a cap and trade system, but that would be very much government-led. So, anonymous attendee asks, will everyone be required to measure grass um, no, I think the simple answer is no, this is not. Grass checks a separate project. I mean, there may be some overlap, but no, we're not expecting everyone to measure grass. Uh, and that was one of the things that was highlighted in our survey is that, you know, because of the nature, there's some people not represented in the grass check network. You know, part-time farmers, you maybe find that difficult. Hill farmers, obviously, maybe the higher end of the dairy sector. So no, I think the short answer to that is no, we will be looking, obviously, still to make use of grass and we're trying to quantify and backward calculation what you are doing from grass but no there it's not a requirement to measure grass every week uh anonymous question will research be carried out on the existing system on farm or will applicants need to change their farming system to suit ag research objectives i suppose in short terms i mean we're not we're realists i mean we're not expecting anyone to to make huge changes or whatever and we want to work with you not the other way around. I mean, I take it that anyone who's applying to the Beacon Farm Network is interested in, in developing, but we're not we're not expecting you to make kind of radical changes to your farming system that you're that you're not comfortable with. So, and there's no way we can we can force that upon you. So, I think the thing is we work with you. I mean, obviously we're wanting to work with farmers and help them develop and improve things as as it goes along, but we're not we're not asking people to make radical changes. Okay, thank you. Um, there's an anonymous question here for you, Denise. Are the five hub farms included in the 50 bacon ones? Well, I suppose we're, we're talking the present tense here, but we're really talking in real terms in the future tense. So will, will the five hub farms be included? Would you like to see that happen? I would imagine that's what we thought would probably happen. But whenever we look at the applications, Peter, if there's a case for a hubs farm, that, that doesn't meet the criteria for the 50 beacon farms, that wouldn't rule it out of, be, of becoming a, a hubs farm. How far away are the payments to farmers, landowners? I'm not sure what you mean by that, John. I mean, we're, talk, we're talking about an annual payment would kind of come at the end of the year, but I think maybe you're talking maybe possibly about payments in carbon or possibly, you know, the changes to environmental payments or future farm support. So I'm not exactly sure what you're grasping at there. Robert, you can maybe take it up. I hear well, you. you've got yes, but well, yes to which one, Robert? 
Is it like All right, final question. I think people see cash signs on carbon sales. However, they may not be farming in a manner that leaves them spare carbon storage. We need to measure what we have in our own farms on a net well I, we have little control but Julian, do you want to say anything there sorry you just broke up on that one there peter for me i'm not sure if, if i think yeah you did but i think to be to answer that question i think i think i think i would say yes i i agree completely with the sentiment of that that statement there is that you know i think we can all think well let's get ourselves so let's sell lots of carbon but I think, and, and Victor Chestnut said the same thing in the webinar we held last night. I think, you know, farmers will be, I think it'll be a big enough challenge to get to carbon net zero, never mind positivity or neutrality, we ought to call it, but we go beyond that and have spare carbon to sell, unless you're really willing to make some, you know, get rid of all the livestock and just kind of go down a very carbon rich route. So I, I absolutely agree. It is, it's, I think the net zero is going to be a hard enough target. So I, and for most farmers, that will be a thing now. For certain maybe farmers in more extensive situations, not so much livestock, that you know the carbon going positivity, we want to call it, is an option. But for I think for most farmers in Northern Ireland, giving the stocking rates and so on, I think you know net zero is plenty ambitious. Peter, uh, oh. I know you'd I know you'd said that there were uh, could we pause the questions, but there was a question asked earlier on on chat which everyone might not have seen. Jason has answered it, uh, and maybe if he could answer it again. Yeah. And the question was, retrospective data collection is not ideal. What about the possibility of an app? Yeah, I, I, that's absolutely what we're, and I completely agree. That's what we're looking at because, you know, we, we're aware of farmers, you're busy people, you know, and the later you leave afterwards to record something, the more chances are it'll not be recorded or it'll not be recorded right. So that's why we've been looking at, you know, options such as possibly the Ivy Web or whatever else. You know, we'll, now we're not looking for people, the people using a software solution already, we're not looking for the change. But, but we are looking at the idea, well, can we kind of help provide farmers with some simple tools that will just record it then and there. So you're injecting the car, you're putting on a bag of fertilizer in the phone, then and there, done. I mean, uh, well, the, you saw that thing at the map earlier with the, the batches that Gillian had. And one of the beautiful things about that is you actually have a mob of field, cattle in one field. You simply slide from one field to another and that just moves the cattle into the next field and it does all the grass calculations and so on based on that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our, our evening. Uh, and my goodness, those have been excellent questions. Absolutely excellent and very, very thoughtful. I hope we've given you adequate answers. I hope we've given you adequate opportunity to ask questions. I would like to thank you all again for giving us the time to attend tonight. I, I hope you will pursue your interest uh, in the Beacon Farm Network and go through the process. Can I thank all the speakers tonight. Can I say finally that in our thinking about reviews of, of our strategy, uh, top of the list of our priorities has been ensuring to the best of our ability, value for money for our levy payers who are the funders. You are the funders of this organization. And your priorities are absolutely essential. We take your questions very, very seriously because that is the insight that we need. That is the insight that we were given so freely during the whole strategic review process. And my goodness, it was of such enormous value to us in coming to our conclusions. So thank you all again. And I, I was going to say I look forward to seeing you all again soon. I haven't seen very many of you. And uh, I, I do appreciate your interaction with, with us. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>